And in that year, the trustees, meeting for the first time, raise a specific question, which they discuss throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no, no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then in 1909, they raised the second question and discuss it. Namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? Well, I doubt at that time if there was any subject more removed from the thinking of most of the people of this country than its involvement in a war. There were intermittent shows in the Balkans, but I doubt very much if many people even knew where the Balkans were. Then finally, they answer that question as follows. We must control the State Department. And, the, uh, and then that, that very naturally raises the question of how do we do that? And um, they answer it by saying we must take over and control the diplomatic machinery of this country. And finally, they resolve to aim at that as an objective. Then time passes, and we are eventually in a war, which would have been World War I. And at that time, they record on their minutes a shocking report in which they dispatched to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too quickly. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914 when World War I broke out. And they arrive at that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. And they realize that that's a pretty big task. So it's to them, it is too big for them alone, so they approach the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that that portion of education which is, could be considered domestic be handled by the Rockefeller Foundation and that portion which is international should be handled by the endowment. And they then decide that the key to the success of these two operations lay in the, an alteration of the teaching of American history. So they approach four of the then most prominent teachers of American history in the country, people like Charles and Mary Byrd, and their suggestion to them is, will they alter the manner in which they present this subject and they get turned down flat? So they then decide that it is necessary for them to do, as they say, build our own stable of historians. And, and then they approach the Guggenheim Foundation, which specializes in fellowships, and say, when we find young men in the process of studying for doctorates in the field of American history, and we feel that they are uh, the right caliber, will you grant them fellowships on our say-so? And the answer is yes. So under that condition, eventually they assemble 20. And they take this 20 potential teachers of American history to London. And there they're briefed 
into what is expected of them when, as and if they secure appointments in keeping with the doctorates they will have earned. And um, that, new, that group of 20 historians ultimately becomes the nucleus of the American Historical Association. And then toward the end of the 1920s, the endowment grants to the American Historical Association $400,000 for a study of our history in a manner which points to what can this country be, can it look forward to in the future. And uh, that culminates in a seven volume study book study the last volume of which is of course in essence a summary of the contents of the other six and the essence of the last volume is the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency that's the story that ultimately grew out of and, of course, was what could have been presented by the members of this Congressional Committee to the Congress as a whole for just exactly what it said. And they this never the, got to that point. This is the story that emerged from the minutes of the, uh, of uh, the Carnegie Fund. That's right. Carnegie Endowment. That's Fund. right. And uh, so it was official to that extent. I see. And Catherine Casey uh, brought all of these back in the form of uh, dictated notes or verbatim readings of the uh, of the minutes. Undictable though. Are those uh, in existence today? I don't know. But if they are, they're, they're somewhere in the archives under the, under the um, control of the Congress House of Representatives. How many people actually heard those? Or were they typed up, transcripts made no. of them? How many people actually heard those uh, recordings? Oh, three maybe. Myself, my top assistants, and Catherine. Yeah, I might tell you this experience as far as its impact on Catherine Casey is concerned. Well, she never was able to return to her law practice. If it hadn't been for Carol Reese's ability to tuck her away in a job with the Federal Trade Commission. I don't know what would have happened to Catherine, but ultimately she lost her mind as a result of it. Terrible shock. To it's, it's, it's a very rough experience to encounter proof of these kinds. Mr. Dodd, what kind, uh, well, can you summarize the, the opposition to the committee, the Reese Committee, and particularly the efforts to sabotage the committee? Well, they began right at, right at the start of, uh, of, of the work of, a, of an operating staff, Mr. Griffin. Um, and it began on the day in which the committee met for the purpose of consenting to or confirming my appointment to the position of director of research. Um, thanks to the abstention of the minority members of the committee, that is the two Democratic members, from voting, why technically I was unanimously appointed. and. Um, well, wasn't the White House involved in opposition? To well, not at, 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 not at this particular point, sir. Mr. Reese ordered counsel and myself to visit Wayne Hayes. And Wayne Hayes was the ranking minority member of the committee as a Democrat. So we, counsel and I, had to go down to Mr. Hayes' office, which we did. Mr. Hayes greeted us with um, the flat statement directed primarily to me, which shows that I am opposed to this investigation. 